Um, basically, as a historian, we usually like to tell stories, and this is just a story, which um, over the past two days I've tried to improvise so that at least it makes sense to an audience like this. Uh, I want to look at um, um, informal migration uh, in southern Africa um, of, of migrants uh, who were coming from areas that were north of Zimbabwe, this South Africa, north of Zimbabwe, which is somewhere up in these territories. I have a map that will show that in detail. Um, during in the period the 1920s and 19. Uh, 50s. Uh, basically, the story uh, goes uh, that um, in the early 1900s, um, with the discovery of gold and diamonds uh, in South Africa, uh, 1867 and 1876, to, to be more specific, uh, there began a process of colonial labor migration which sort of uh, harnessed, you know, um, uh, labor, uh, both internally within South Africa, as well as Southern Rhodesia, which is Zimbabwe today, uh, as well as externally uh, within, within the region uh, from territories that were up in the north. And in this case, we are talking about Malawi, we're talking about Zambia, we're talking about Mozambique, and of course the labor uh, market also reached as far as Tanzania, and the South African labor market as well went as far as China and India in, in the early, early uh, uh, stages. Um, so you realize that um, in the present, um, in Southern Africa, South Africa as an economic powerhouse has sort of been you know, uh, inundated with um, a lot of an influx of, of migrants. And most, in most cases, most of these migrants are illegal migrants or undoc undocumented migrants. And um, I try to argue uh, in this particular paper that um, this phenomenon of informal migration or clandestine migration is not, uh, you know, unique. It's not uniquely a post-apartheid or post-colonial, uh, you know, phenomenon. It has its antecedents in the colonial period. And this is the material that I'm trying to talk about, just looking at how this whole process of informal migration took place in the period, the 1920s, and the 1950s. So I take a case of uh, what I call the northern or the northerners, uh, migrants from Malawi, migrants from Mozambique, migrants from Zambia, as a case trying to look at how they migrated over a period of time. And then at the end, I'll try to draw some parallels in relation to what is happening uh, in, the, in the present. So the basic argument here is that uh, if you look in the period, the 1920s to the 1950s, um, these migrants practiced what I would like to call uh, a stop-and-go process, or in this case, they settled in motion. So they were moving, but in the process of moving, migrating down to South Africa, they were settling along the way because uh, such a migration process would take quite, quite a long period uh, of, of, of time. <clears throat> um, there is literature, uh, which is historical in this case, which uh, basically tries to, to, to historicize you know, this movement, but without it being very explicit on uh, how the northerners you know, practiced uh, this settling in motion, how they sort of moved from the north through Zimbabwe as well as uh, you know, down to, 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 to South Africa. Um, basically, the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, much of the information that I use in this particular research comes from the colonial archive, um, in the sense that uh, the period of the 1920s and the 1950s, uh, there is very little in terms of um, ethnographic uh, material. In this case, I mean life histories from, from, from informants or migrants that I could talk, up, talk to in relation to their experiences during this period. So I use much of the material from, from the, the, the colonial archive to try you know, uh, to document or to come up with this particular uh, uh, narrative. And what is more interesting in this uh, particular uh, slide is the fact that um, you realize that um, most of the most prominent uh, northerners, and in this case Malawians, who uh, ended up you know, being more influential 
uh, in the regional politics of Southern Africa. In this case, I'm talking about Clement Kadali, as well as Hastings Kamuzu Banda, who became the first uh, uh, president or prime minister of independent Malawi, went through the process of, of you know, settling in motion, uh, coming from Nyasaland, which, was Malawi, which is Malawi today, through southern Rhodesia, and then down to, 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 to South Africa. Um, <clears throat> this is basically a, a, a map of the, the routes that uh, migrants would follow, uh, you know, from, um, from the north. Um, with the main, you know, labor pools or labor reservoirs being the ones that I mentioned, northern Rhodesia up there, uh, Nyasaland, Malawi, somewhere there, and those were basically the routes. Most of them would pass through Mozambique, others would pass through southern Rhodesia and then down to, to, to South Africa, and there are reasons that I explain why, you know, they would, you know, practice such a, a phenomenon. Um, the reasons are, are here. Uh, basically, <clears throat> you'd realize that, um, of course, the whole narrative goes back, you know, to the issue of colonization, how colonization, you know, split or divided borders uh, into two, and then, uh, of course, you know, sort of, you know, criminalizing uh, African mobility, uh, criminalizing movement of people, you know, across borders, and then, you know, uh, the coming in of, you know, the creation or the construction of various labels or nomenclature, such as illegal, clandestine, irregular, informal, or undocumented migrants, and, of course, most famously, uh, border, border jumpers. So I'm trying to trace, you know, you know, the creation or construction of all these labels in relation to uh, the coming in of colonization, and there is quite a lot of literature, you know, in relation to, 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 to that. But what is also more interesting uh, is the kind of agency that uh, these migrants had um, in the period under discussion. Uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, the colonial labor migration system was so complicated in Southern Africa, was so, so complicated in the sense that um, officially <coughs> there were labor recruiting agencies. Uh, in South Africa, there was the Vitz Rand Native Labor Association, which was responsible for formally recruiting the migrants from uh, the Northern Territories for, for South African mines, as well as, in some cases, uh, some industries. But you realize that these labor agencies or organizations had a monopoly of you know, labor recruitment. And at the end of the day, um, some other tertiary or secondary industries, in particular agriculture, as well as domestic service, were not, you know, did not have the privilege you know, to get such labor from, uh, through the, uh, the WNLA uh, channels. So in most cases, they would hire this labor, usually outside the law. And this labor that was hired, usually outside the law, was in most cases um, informal. And it is these secondary industries that sort of fed from you know, uh, the informal migration that would take place within this particular uh, period. What is also interesting here is that um, in the period under discussion, South Africa and Southern Rhodesia, which is Zimbabwe today, were in sort of competition uh, for labor, for regional labor. Why? Because both of them were sort of uh, colonial economic powerhouses. Southern Rhodesia was also expanding in terms of mines, in terms of agriculture. The same with South Africa. Uh, and at the end of the day, you would realize that South Africa, because it was lying at the bottom of, of the map, much of the labor that would come from the north would first pass through Southern Rhodesia. And in order for, it, for South Africa to benefit from such labor, they would encourage you know, this illegal movement or informal movement of migrants would, you know, uh, pass through uh, its borders, uh, getting down to, 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 uh, into, into, into South Africa. So there is, from the colonial archive, there are statistics uh, in terms of the movement of uh, these uh, migrants and um, uh, the whole idea of them sort of uh, settling in motion. What is emerging from the colonial archive, basically, is that <coughs> officials from southern Rhodesia were sort of complaining uh, that in most cases, migrants who are coming from the north uh, do not you know, stay very long uh, at their workplace. Most of them, whenever they get into southern Rhodesia, they have you know, an intention, they show an intention clearly that uh, 
uh, they want to, to go as far as, as, as South Africa. So there, is, there are a lot of statistics coming from uh, various uh, colonial officials, in this case native commissioners, who document you know, uh, northerners who are asking or requesting for passes to go uh, down to, to, to South Africa. And in one of the instances, uh, in the 1930s thereabouts, it was estimated that at least 7,000 northerners would find you know, uh, their way illegally uh, down to South Africa. And the numbers would sort of increase uh, in the 1940s to around to about 14,000 uh, a year. Um, of course, the year is something that it almost relates to, 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 to what I've been seeing so far. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the, the, the quantities uh, uh, of you know, Africans who domiciled themselves within uh, South Africa in the period 1911 to 1970, uh, these are the kind of figures in relation to the year as well as the country. Uh, these figures uh, include both, uh, of course, the documented ones as well as uh, the undocumented ones. What would usually happen with South Africa, as I said before, is that um, they would make, the South African authorities would make sure that they document uh, that particular uh, person uh, in terms of numbering. So much that by 1951, uh, the number of foreign Africans uh, or regional Africans within South Africa reached a peak of almost uh, 600,000. With, of course, Mozambique um, as well as um, <clears throat> Lesotho, as well as Malawi, to some extent, you know, being the main main uh, suppliers of, of you know of this of this particular uh, regional uh, 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 labour. Um, <clears throat> the narrative of um, this migration um, also showcases you know uh, various levels of agency, especially amongst uh, you know these northern uh, labour uh, migrants. So there's quite a lot in the colonial archive that sort of um, uh, relays, you know, how <coughs> uh, Africans who were migrating down to South Africa, you know, sort of uh, exploited various channels that were offered by the colonial system so that at least they would reach their goal of going as far down as South Africa. And one of them was the issue of social uh, networks. Uh, in this case, uh, there were complaints that were coming from, um, you know, uh, colonial administrators, colonial officials of... Uh, migrants in South Africa sending, you know, uh, messages, sending letters to, to, to their colleagues uh, in the north about, you know, the better working conditions that were prevailing uh, in the Union uh, of South Africa. So you realize that a lot of um, northerners were usually caught or arrested within southern Rhodesia uh, with, you know, such incriminating letters about the better working conditions uh, within South Africa. And the main complaint there was that because it is because of these messages or these letters that Rhodesia uh, was sort of suffering, you know, from a labor inadequacy uh, during uh, this particular uh, period. And the other, uh, of course, uh, the other um, element <coughs> was, of course, the issue of forging of, of passes. Uh, this sort of also relays to what I'll talk about in the end in relation to issues of connections or parallels of what was happening during the colonial period with what is happening uh, uh, today. So it realized that uh, uh, these northerners had a penchant of, you know, uh, forging uh, uh, registration certificates, uh, IDs, forging passes, so that there will be, it's to enable them to move across uh, the, re the region as fast as possible getting into South Africa. So there were a lot of these guys who were named, who were caught with such uh, forged passes. Uh, this is one of the examples of, of such uh, uh, passes, uh, which they would forge. Uh, of course, this is typed. They usually wrote these things on, 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 by, uh, on using their own handwriting. And uh, this would be a pass that would allow somebody to pass through southern Rhodesia and go as far as, 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 as South Africa. And in most cases, uh, these letters were sort of um, uh, were, were forged. Um, I came across, um, you know, various 
uh, individual and as well as you know uh, bigger syndicates of people who were uh, caught uh, with you know uh, involved in this forgery of passes. And one most interesting uh, case study uh, that I came across is of this particular Malawian who was called uh, Webster. Um, he had gone to work in, in South Africa, and then uh, I think he was fired from work and went back home to, to, to Malawi, uh, Nyasaland by then. But on leaving South Africa, he stole a booklet of passes, which he ended up, uh, of course, selling to colleagues who wanted to go to, to South Africa. And a number of, you know, of people, of a number of his clients, were sort of caught up in southern Rhodesia with uh, such passes. And at the end of the day, they would incriminate him for, for, you know, for giving them uh, those particular uh, uh, passes. Um, <clears throat> in the present, if you want to go into South Africa, uh, whether you are coming from Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, or Zambia, you can formally get into South Africa. Of course, you are given uh, you know, uh, those number of days. In most cases, it's usually two weeks to a month, and in some cases, up to three months. You are entitled to 90 days of staying into, in South Africa if you do not have a, a, a particular permit, of, you know, a, a, be it a study permit or a, a, a permanent raise or working permit. So you are given at least 90, at most 90 days uh, in a year to stay in South Africa. But what usually happens uh, even in the, uh, today is that when you go into South Africa and you are given, let's say, your two weeks, most people uh, make use of those two weeks. They get into South Africa and in some cases simply disappear, you know, within South Africa and stay uh, forever. In some cases, um, you get your passport stamped at the border, uh, you get into South Africa, you send back your passport uh, on the bus. You remain maybe in Jobek. You send back your passport on the bus. It gets stemmed out, indicating that you've moved out of South Africa, or at least you are still inside. So it can get stemmed out, and then it returns to you. So this was also prevailing uh, during uh, the colonial period, where, of course, you know, people would simply get uh, reach as far as uh, Musina or Messina, which is at the border between uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa. They'll be given granted four days, and then they will disappear uh, you know, into the tentacles of, of, of South Africa. What is also interesting there is uh, the kind of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, deviancy or misdemeanors that characterized some of these northern migrants. Uh, as they were moving, settling, uh, moving gradually across southern Rhodesia, uh, getting to South Africa, there were a lot of you know, issues that were reported about you know, uh, the various misdemeanors that they had. Uh, for example, they would desert the workplace since, of course, their main target was to reach the shores of South Africa. So they would work you know, uh, uh, for a short period of time at a particular workplace, going down and down until they, they reach uh, South Africa. In most cases, there were a lot of you know, uh, uh, reports with regards to, to theft, theft of stock, theft within the stores uh, by these uh, particular northern migrants. And this sort of characterization or stereotype has also uh, prevailed in the present, uh, not necessarily on um, targeting uh, Malawians, Mozambicans, or, 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 or Zambians, but generally uh, regional labor migrants that are getting into South Africa today. Uh, you will know very well that uh, South Africa is a haven of crime, and in most cases, people who are usually blamed first for, for, for such crimes, be they robberies and everything, are usually the migrants. So it's some, there is a connection uh, that one can also draw uh, to, to, to that extent. Um, <clears throat> of course, the colonial authorities tried to, 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 to curb uh, you know, uh, this illegal inflow or influx of migrants. But one of the main challenges was, of course, the border was so porous. Why? Because it was uh, so, so, so huge or so long. And uh, in most cases, it was very, very difficult for the colonial police, police to, you know, to, to, to monitor a movement 
uh, along, along the border. This is also prevailing even today, uh, where uh, both the South African and the Zimbabwean authorities find it very, very difficult you know, to, to, to take control or to manage uh, the border. So there is, there is a lot of you know, movement, illegal movement, of both people, contraband and everything, a lot of smuggling that is even taking place today. Cars being stolen in South Africa, they find their way uh, into, into, into Zimbabwe because the border is, is, is very, very uh, long. The same with you know, uh, this lack of, of uh, you know, stringent laws or fines. You realize that in the colonial period, when you were caught uh, uh, without adequate uh, uh, documentation, they were, you, were simply, you were simply detained, sometimes jailed for a, for a week, and then released. And on release, uh, these uh, northerners were not you know, deported, but they would be simply uh, told to pay uh, some 15 shillings for a permit, which would allow them to, to get employment uh, within uh, South Africa. And it is today as well uh, that we realize that uh, the scenario is almost uh, replaying itself within, uh, 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 in South Africa, where, of course, um, when one is detained, uh, on getting deported, they go as far as the Bridge border post, and when they are released, very soon they find their way back uh, into, 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 into South Africa. Um, on this particular slide, uh, I just wanted to, to emphasize the point that um, the issue of agency as well, where uh, the northerners uh, made use of colonial infrastructure, and in this case, the transport system, to, you know, uh, to, to, make, to quicken their journey across uh, the region into South Africa. And it happened in 1936 that the Rhodesian authorities uh, introduced free transport for northerners who were coming from Malawi and Zambia. And it is with this transport that some of them found you know, a way of, going, of getting to South Africa as quick as possible. So you realized that some colonial authorities ended up uh, sort of you know, complaining about uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, incentive. In the last 15 years, <clears throat> this is what has been happening along the border. Um, there is a fence, uh, there is a crocodile infested river, which is known as the Limpopo River. Um, during dry times, people try to cross. Um, uh, some succeed, some don't. Um, at the height of the Zimbabwean crisis, from 2000 to 2008, a lot of Zimbabweans you know, uh, tried in vain to cross into South Africa. And in most cases, it is these images that I'm showing here of people trying to reach uh, you know, the promised land of, 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 of South Africa. And <clears throat> my argument here is, as I have said, this is its antecedents uh, in, the, in the colonial uh, period. So in the end, um, I'm trying to make connections between what was happening uh, in the colonial period with what has been happening uh, today in the last uh, 15 or 20 so years. You realize that, uh, for example, the South African government continues to exploit these illegal channels of, of, of influx of labor. For example, there's quite a lot, you know, a lot of noise has been made with regards to how uh, the South African, the post-apartheid South African authorities sort of, you know, exploited, you know, formal, formerly illegal migrants to construct infrastructure for the 2010 uh, Soccer World Cup. Uh, of course, they simply granted, you know, these formerly undocumented migrants uh, special permits so that at least, uh, you know, they would be able to work and construct. So over time, uh, this has been the process uh, but what is critical, which sort of relates to what has been said all along, is that this migration remains a critical component of the regional economic system within Southern Africa, both in terms of the remittances uh, that you know, are sent back home by these migrants, as well as the various uh, infrastructural development uh, that is uh, taking place. Thank you.